Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the children. Thank you for their basic faith, little mustard seed faith, and yet, though it's smallest among the garden plants, it grows to fill the corner of the garden. Lord, may our faith grow as well. Lord, as we turn our attention to your word, may it speak into our hearts. Tell us your truth, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you brought your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. And we'll get there in a moment. There were three clergy. They had gathered together for lunch, and uh, they were arguing about what is the most efficacious posture for prayer. If you want your prayers answered, how, how should you pray? Um, and in the corner of the room working on the phone line was a telephone repairman, and so he was kind of eavesdropping on this discussion that was taking place. And the Episcopal priest said to the other clergy that were there and said, well, obviously, the most e efficacious way to pray is devoutly kneeling. Um, and the Assemblies of God pastor said, oh no, you're all wet. When I pray, I lift my eyes to heaven, I raise my hands to the heavens, I open my palms to receive God's blessing. And the Catholic priest said, oh, you're both wrong. The most effective way to pray is like at my ordination. I lay cruciform prostrate on the floor before the altar, and God heard my prayers. And he couldn't contain himself anymore, and so the telephone repairman, he, he entered in and said, the best time of prayer I ever had in my life was when I was hanging upside down from the top of a telephone pole by one foot. <laughs> so if your prayer life isn't going very well, you might try climbing up a telephone pole. That, that might aid your prayers. Um, if you've got your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 3, and you'll see here that Paul is talking about postures in prayer. If you talk to people about worship, in America, mostly they'll talk to you about singing and song styles or whether they like liturgy or they don't like liturgy. Or, and it actually, if you look in the Bible, the Bible talks an awful lot about posture. Raising holy hands, lifting your eyes up to heaven, kneeling, falling prostrate on the floor. There's a whole lot more about posture than there is about the kind of songs that we should be singing. And so we begin in verse 14, and so Paul is responding to something that has gone before it, but we'll get there in a second, for this reason. And what came before is what Paul is responding to. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Now look at chapter 3, verse 1, because it should be right there on your page. Paul, a prisoner on behalf of the Gentiles. Paul literally is in prison in Rome. He's writing this letter to a Gentile church, and he is literally chained to a member of the Praetorian Guard. They're the secret service. They're the ones that were responsible for guarding the Caesar. And so some had protection detail, and others were guarding uh, uh, prisoners. And Paul was chained to one of them. How'd you like to be chained to Paul? Up and down and up and down. And he's praying and he's down on his knees. And you're chained to him. And so he's tugging you along. And, and Paul doesn't care. Paul's praying. And so Paul begins to pray. Now, when I was beginning to learn to pray, I spent a lot of time at my grandmother's house. And so I'd get my bath. And now it's bedtime. And we go into the front room, the bedroom in the front room. And so she'd have me kneel next to the bed and clasp my hands together and close my eyes. And we would pray the Lord's Prayer. And then I would pray, now I lay me down to sleep. Um, and that's how you pray, because that's how my grandmother taught me how to pray. And so as I got a little older and I noticed I grew up an Episcopalian. So the guy in the joke, devoutly kneeling. We have kneelers in the church. By the way, we have kneelers in the church. They're in that corner and that corner. And if you would like to try devoutly kneeling during times of prayer, um, the kneelers are available for you to do that. Um, if you've had your knees replaced, you might want to think about something else, but just saying. So Paul is, he's a kneeler. There was a second century uh, early church father by the name of Hegesippus. I got it, Hegesippus. And he is the one who told us, yes, I got it right, honey, it's Hegesippus. Um, he's the one who told us about James, the brother of Jesus, that James spent so much time in intercessory prayer for the church, praying that God would forgive the church. And that was back in the day. How much more do we need that? 
that James spent so much time that he developed calluses on his knees and his nickname was Camel Knees. Um, and so he, he, he was constantly in prayer on his knees. Now commentators, if you read commentaries, will tell us that the normal posture for Jewish prayer is standing. So in Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable about a Pharisee and a publican, and they both come into the temple to pray, and they, they stand, and the Pharisee lifts up his eyes to heaven, and I love Luke's gospel, and he prayed to himself. Um, it, his prayer didn't get beyond the ceiling. And then there was the poor publican, and again, and he's standing to pray, but he couldn't even lift up his eyes because of his sin had so weighed him down. And I'll let you read the rest of it on your own if you don't know the story. But the normal way for a Jew to pray is to stand. And yet Paul has been driven to his knees. What drove Paul to his knees? If you were here last week, here's what drove him to his knees. Look up in chapter 2 at verses 20 and 21. Paul was telling us about the church. And he said the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. In other words, built on the teaching of the scripture. It's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself is the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. The people of God are a holy temple. And then the beginning of chapter 3 Paul understands that, now Paul was a Pharisee, and Pharisees were really religious, and Pharisees were separatists, and so they believed, if you were here last week about the Gentiles, well the Gentiles are beneath contempt, they're less than human, Jews considered them dogs, and the only reason God created them is so that they could fuel the fires of hell. So that's, that's how they felt about Gentiles. Well, now Paul has started a church, a Gentile church in Ephesus. Look at chapter 3 um, at the end of the first paragraph. This is the mystery, says Paul, that the Gentiles along with the Jews are fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. That they are included in this holy temple. That is earth-shattering. Ten years before, Paul would have denied it with the whole of his being. And that God doesn't need a temple in Jerusalem. God is building his own temple of people from every tongue and tribe and nation. And Paul is so overcome with this image and this understanding of the church that his knees buckle and he falls to his knees and he begins to pray. What is it that we believe about the church? We just got done confessing, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. God is creating for himself a holy temple made of people from every tongue and tribe and nation from all around the world. That he is taking each of those individual stones and placing it. In America, most people believe that the church is a voluntary association. I go to this church because I like the youth group, or I go to that church because I like the music, or I go, and I go with other people who like the same things that I like, and it's an affinity-based, voluntary association. Theologian John Williamson Nevin said, that's not a church, that's a pile of sand. There are each individual grains that happen to be lying in the same spot, but it's inert. There's no life to that. That's just a pile of sand. What is the church? The church is a living, holy temple animated by the Spirit of God and, God, and Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And that it is an object of worship. It is an object, it's a supernatural entity. I believe in the Father. I believe in the Son. I believe in the Holy Ghost. And I believe in the church. The church is a, a God-filled, God-inspired, Spirit-filled institution and it is an institution and organism. It is a body. And that that's what the church is. We have way too low a view of the church. We have a bunch of consumers that go around shopping in affinity for finding people that are like them who have the same tastes in music and chairs and buildings. And that is not what the church is. The church is a holy temple. And it has sunk into Paul. And so Paul falls on his knees, and he begins to pray to dedicate the temple. Why is he on his knees? You're supposed to stand when you pray, but when it's really important, when it's significant, 
you fall on your knees, and so did the Jews. Solomon in Jerusalem, when he spent all of his money to build the greatest building in the ancient world, he built the temple, and he used all of his resources to build a temple and praise to God. And then he dedicated the temple. Second Chronicles chapter 6, beginning at verse 13. Solomon had made a bronze platform, five cubits long, five cubits wide, three cubits high, and he set it in the court of the temple that he is now dedicating. And in the presence of all the people, he knelt on his knees and he spread out his hands toward heaven. And he said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth. And then he proceeds to pray and to dedicate the temple. I'm sure that that's in the back of Paul's mind as he's considering what is this holy temple that God is building. And, and, and he is praying. And then he goes to prayer for the church in Ephesus. And if you read commentaries, and I do as I prepare for this, there are two petitions, or three petitions, or four petitions, or six petitions, or eight, depending on what you do with all the Greek participles that he stacks one on top of another on top of another. Just for the sake of uh, clarity and ease, I'm going to follow uh, the henna clauses. The what? The henna clauses. In Greek, there is a little word, henna. It's I-N-A with a heavy breathing mark above the I. You get an H sound. It's a henna clause. Henna clauses set, set aside the, the, the thing that's going to follow, a process that will follow. But sometimes henna clauses talk about dreams or visions or hopes or wishes. And that's what Paul is praying here. And there are four. So we translate henna as that or so that or in order that. And so there are four of those in these verses, 16 through 19. So I'm just going to say four. It's, you know, you, you can argue with the linguists and you can argue with the commentators. We're just going to say four just for convenience sake. So the first henna clause, verse 16, Paul says that, henna, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. We don't understand life, the mystery of life. Why are we here? What is the meaning and purpose of life? Ask people that, and you'll ask a hundred people that, you'll get a hundred different answers to that. We can't master life. We have people in their 40s and their 50s, and they're living hand to mouth, and they're struggling uh, to, to make ends meet, and they haven't figured out what to do with themselves, how, how to live their lives. They're, they're buffeted by every feeling that they have, every wind that blows, and they can't master life. And so Paul is saying that this mystery, this mastery of life comes how? It comes to us by the Spirit of God. And so Paul prays for them again, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his Spirit in your inner being. The church are Gentile believers. They, they don't have an Old Testament background. They don't have a theological background. They don't know a whole lot. Um, but Paul wants them to understand this thing. And he uses a phrase at the end of that henna clause, uh, uh, in your inner being. Um, and it is a phrase that he uses elsewhere in the New Testament. There's a close parallel to it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11. And it says this, for we live, we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be man manifested in our mortal flesh. Inner being, mortal flesh. Uh, the King James says, inner man, that we may be strengthened in the inner man. When I was a child, our family took a trip out west, and we got out to the Four Corners, and so that was really cool to me. I put a foot in Utah, and a foot in Colorado, and a hand in Arizona, and a hand in New Mexico, and all in one place at one time in a moment. I, I was standing in four different states all at one time. 
You know the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength. And as post-enlightenment, Western, scientific kind of people, we like to dissect. We like to slice and dice and to pull things apart to see how they work and to understand the inner, inner workings of things. That's not the biblical view. The biblical view is that it is a one thing. You are an organism. And you, what makes you you is at the intersection, at the four corners of heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's where you are, who you are, who God created you to be, at the four corners at that intersection. And Paul is praying for you to be strengthened in the inner being where all of these things come together that make you you that you would be strengthened to give you hope that it's possible to live the Christian life. We struggle with sin in our lives. We've been Christians for years and we still struggle with sin. Is this, is this Christian life impossible to live? No. May we be strengthened in the inner man in order to do this. And so he's giving this prayer to give them hope that living the life that Christ intends for us is even a possibility that according to the riches of His glory, look across the page at chapter 1, verse 3. We're, we're broke. we got nothing. But verse 3 says, chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every, every, no exception, spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. We don't have any resources. See, what Paul is preaching is totally counterintuitive and countercultural. It's when we acknowledge that we're weak, that we become strong. It's when we acknowledge that we have no resources that God gives us His resources. So let me put it this way. We are poor until God gives us what we need, His blessings, His resources. We are powerless until God gives us His Spirit. And that's what He's offering us in this prayer. That's what He's praying for the Ephesians, that they would have that. And then, we are dead. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. You are dead in your trespasses and sins until Christ comes in, but when we have Christ, we have life, an abundant life, a full life, and that we will be strengthened with these resources in the inner part of ourself. That's Paul's prayer. That's Paul's plea for his church. They're baby Christians. They don't have much of a religious background, and so he wants to set them on the right path, and he wants them to have the spiritual resources necessary to live. Verse 17, first 17a, here's another that. Hina, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's a shorty. That's what Lynn talked about up here. That he might dwell in your hearts through faith. Well, that's redundant and hopelessly repetitive. He's writing to a bunch of Christians. Of course they have Christ in their heart through faith. How could they not? That's what a Christian is. If you don't have Christ in your heart, you're not a Christian. So he's praying for his Christian friends in this church in Ephesus to become Christians? No, that's not what he's praying. He's praying that they would understand Lynn's children's illustration, that we live in a world that's bounded and in a world that has limits, that by faith in Christ, that vistas and horizons open up before us in ways that we don't understand. And that this faith is a thing that is alive and that it is growing and developing even within us. J.D. Greer wrote a book, and I appreciated his spirit in writing it, but stop inviting Christ into your heart um, because it's not biblical. That's his contention. Well, we'll see in a moment. It kind of is biblical. Um, he, I mean, what's Paul say here at the beginning of 17? So that Christ may dwell where? In your hearts through faith. I went to Fuller Seminary, and there was a theology professor there by the name of Robert Boyd Munger. And he wrote uh, a little pamphlet for InterVarsity. Um, it's not the greatest theological tome of the 20th century. It's a 10-page little pamphlet, My Heart, Christ's Home. And so you don't give your house keys to you stand in the village and pass them out to anybody who happens to walk by. You give your house key to your neighbor. You give your house key to a family member, people who you know. Faith in the New Testament is trust. People that you trust, people that you have a track record with, there's a reason you trust them because there's a track record there. And so you give them your key. They can hang on to that and they're not going to abuse that privilege. And they, they have. So you invite Christ into your heart. That's what Paul is praying for them. Not just that he, they invite him in, but that that 
relationship would grow. Now, the first time you open the door to Christ and he comes in, um, you, you show him, this is the, this is the uh, living room here, and that's my recliner, and this is my game console, and that's my big screen TV, and you know, you've run the vacuum across the shag carpet before he came. And then you take him into the dining room, and you knew he was coming, and so you've got your monogram silver and your grandmother's china on the table with the crystal, because that's how we live every day, all day, right? We're, we're putting on the doll. Yeah, that's how we live. No, that's not how we live. There's paper plates and paper napkins on the table with plastic forks and spoons. Come on, let's get real. And you invite Christ in, and he sees how you really are in, in your heart of hearts. And you invite him in, and you look in the kitchen, and you show him the pots and the pans and the bowls and the utensils and all of that stuff. You take him upstairs, and you show him the bedroom. And as you come back down again, he catches a whiff of this closet under the stairs where you hide all your mess. And Christ is polite. And so he comes in, and he, he doesn't say anything about that smell that's emanating from up under the closet and under the stairs. He doesn't say anything. But you've invited him in. And as Christ lives there over the course of time, Christ fills the whole of the house, and he fills the nooks and the crannies and the corners. And at a certain point, Eventually, God willing, you give him permission to go to work on that closet that's under the stairs and to clean all that stuff out. Stuff that you're ashamed of, stuff that you're embarrassed about, stuff that you wish wasn't so, stuff that you wish didn't exist. And Christ can go in there and he can take care of all of that stuff. That's Paul's prayer for them at the beginning of 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that your faith over the course of time will grow and develop and fill all in all within you. Third henna sentence. There's a dash there and the next one is that. Henna. That you being rooted and grounded in love. This is a long one. This is half a 17, all of 18, and half a 19. That you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ. To know the love of Christ. Paul is writing to a church of Greek people. Greeks were very proud of their heritage. They have a lot to be proud of in terms of their heritage. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, knowledge puffeth up. Um, the Greeks were smart people. And the Greeks had a lot of philosophy and they understood a lot of things. And they lived in their heads. They're a lot like me. And Paul is saying, now you're missing the mark by 18 inches. It's not your head, it's your heart. It's not that I read this book and now I understand all there is to know about Christianity and so now what's, what have you got for me now? Or that you read a systematic theology or that you read a, a sociology book and now that you know all there is to know about all of that. That's the way the Greek mind worked. That's, that's the way they understood things. But Paul's saying, no, you're missing the boat. He's saying that you, being rooted and grounded in love. Now, he's mixing his metaphors. Rooted is agricultural. You plant a seed, and it begins to grow, and it sends down a root. And from the root, it draws the nutrients from the soil. It draws the water, and it enables this thing to grow. And grounded is a term from architecture. It's talking about the foundation. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, hey, don't build your house house on the sand. You build it on a rock. You build it on a firm and strong foundation. And when you have a strong foundation, then the house itself is strong and able to withstand the storms that come against it. And so that's what Paul is talking about. And how are we rooted and grounded? In love. And love isn't intellectual. It's experiential. Love isn't personal, it's interpersonal. It requires an a I and a thou. I went to monk camp and they gave me a verse and said, now go into your cell and meditate on this verse. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Meditate for four hours. Well, that's the verse. Four hours on that and I'm by myself. I mean, that's hard to do. Paul is not, he, Paul's saying, no, 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 we don't do this individually. We do this corporately. God is building for himself a holy temple. And that we each have a part in that building, and we each have a contribution to make of our spiritual gifts and our abilities and all of those various things to one another. 
and that we experience love in this community, one with another, not just individually and personally, so that you may be rooted and grounded in love, and that you may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. We skipped over just one little line, to all the saints. This is intended to be a corporate thing, that we experience love corporately that we love one another. There are 75, 80, one another's in the New Testament. Build one another up, encourage one another, stimulate one another to love and good deeds, bear one another's burdens, pray for one another. On and on it goes. That's what Paul is praying for the church in Ephesus, that they would understand with all the saints being built into this holy temple what it means to love and grounded in love and that um, the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and we don't get this until it sinks down within us to soul depth. I have a friend who has a sailboat, and he likes to sail in his favorite place. He grew up in Wilmington, is there on his boat, and on a beautiful day when there's just a tiny little breeze rippling the, the, the sails and the, the water, um, and the sun is shining down, he's in heaven. It's gorgeous. But when there's a Category 4 hurricane ripping in to the harbor where he's got his boat and the, you know, the, the boat is about to capsize and it's flipping and rolling and spinning and nobody in their right mind would be on that boat. But when the anchor falls to soul depth, nothing's changed for the anchor. It can be chaos on the surface, but where the anchor is, it's calm. It's, it's just it's the way it always is. And that's Paul's prayer for them, that they would be anchored in the faith and in the love of God. Individually, yes, that God loves us individually, but also corporately, together as the people of God. And then verse 19, the next ten of phrase. And to know the love of God, I'm sorry, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. To know the love of Christ that surpasses... See, this was their problem. Love surpasses knowledge. They knew a lot. They were smart people. But they didn't understand the nature of love. And that love is more important than knowledge. That's hard for me. I guess I'm not Greek, but I have that kind of mindset. That's a hard thing. I understand lots of stuff, but that doesn't mean that I feel all that stuff. And the desire of Paul is that this stuff gets to a heart level and it grips them emotionally and within them so that they understand that. And then the final henna phrase is um, 19, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I'm a finite human being. God is infinite. How can I have the fullness of God? Well, I mean, strictly speaking, it's irrational and it makes no sense, and I can't. Although it says about Christ in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, that in Him the fullness of deity was found in bodily form. In Him all things hold together in fullness. Christ is the fullness. So somehow it's possible. How is it possible? Here's an illustration. I went to Fuller Seminary on the West Coast, and there'd be a semester break, and occasionally Cheryl and I, we'd take the kids, and we'd go down to the beach. And we stand there on the seashore, and it's just the two of us, and we're looking out across the Pacific on a clear day, which aren't a lot of those in Southern California. And if it's a clear day, you can see Catalina Island kind of on the horizon, about 20 miles away. Um, and you can, and on a clear day, you can see. And there we are at the edge of the Pacific Ocean, two finite little dots spread before this massive ocean that seems boundless, that seems limitless. It goes as far beyond what the eye can see and to be able to take in. Now imagine I have a quart jar and the waves are coming in from Japan and they're crashing on the beach in Southern California and I take my jar and I hold it and the fullness of the Pacific Ocean comes and immediately in an instant it fills my jar just like that. I'm empty. I don't have anything, but the fullness of the Pacific comes in. And I take a lid and I screw it on real tight. And do I have the whole of the Pacific Ocean in my little jar? No. But when it came to me, it was the fullness of the Pacific coming.
coming toward me and I was able to take what I needed. It supplied what I needed to fill my little quart jar and when my little quart jar runs out I can take it and I can take the lid off and I can hold it again and the fullness of that Pacific Ocean, its power, its strength, it will come again and in an instant fill it. And that's the way that God is. That God is boundless. God is limitless. I don't have all of the fullness of the Pacific in a jar but I have the experience of the power of the waves and the, the, the fullness of that ocean coming in my direction and that's what that's the kind of image that's the picture that Paul is trying to paint for those in Ephesus now he gets done praying does he say amen no he's not done and so he then goes into doxology and he gives a doxology two Greek words doxa it means praise or glory and logos, word. Words of praise, words of glory. Paul is so overcome with this image of the church that he's praying for this church in Ephesus and he's dedicating them to the Lord like Solomon did in the temple. Down on his knees, praying his heart and guts out on behalf of the Ephesians. And when he gets done, he's not done. Now to him who is able to do beyond all that we can ask or even begin to imagine, according to his power which is at work within us, to him be glory in his church in this age and in the age to come. That this is a benediction, a doxology that's often used in church. I use it from time to time. It's, these are wonderful words. And what is it that he's praying? It's another prayer. It's a prayer of praise. It's a prayer of glory to God. If God answers these prayers on behalf of the Ephesians, what a mighty church that church would be and how filled and blessed those folks would be. And so now to Him, who? To this God who is limitless and boundless. Now to Him who is what? Able. He's, I'm not able. I, I'm broke. I have no resources. I, I have no power unless He gives me His Holy Spirit. I have no life unless He gives me His Son, Jesus Christ. Now to Him who is able, but God is able. Able what? Able to do. To do whatever we need Him to do. And He'll do it in a way like Lynn did, in a way that we don't expect. To Him who is able to do exceeding abundantly, beyond all that we could ask or even begin to imagine. So the question as I close this morning is, is your God able? A, God is almighty. B, God is boundless, able. L, He is limitless. He is like the Pacific Ocean. That you get as much as you can and there's still that much and more and more and more besides. And that God is eternal and God is everlasting. It doesn't just happen in a moment, but that this relationship grows over the course of time and space and eternity. And that it is an everlasting relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. Paul can't help himself. He prays his heart out for the church and when he realizes the implications of what he's prayed, he can't help but praise and glorify God. Is your God able? Amen.